what campaign types seem to work best for you? Because, you know, there's all the lottery campaigns, doing single ASIN. Um, sure. What's like best for Q4 from your experience? I mean, I, th I think they all can perform well. I, yeah. My lottery campaigns performed well last year. I, I looked at some of my different stats to bef ahead of time just to see like what was working in Q4 of last year and, and pretty much everything was performing. I had, um, so lottery campaigns just worked across the board. Um, they had pretty significant order volume. They helped drive those uh, long tail search terms and get those cheap clicks. So those are still effective, still run those. And if you're just getting started with ads, that's probably where I would start. Speaking of cheap clicks, do you turn those up as well, the lotteries? Because you know they do tend to have very low bids. Do you like double them for December? No, I wouldn't say I necessarily double. I treat them very similar. I, I manage that performance similarly to what I do with the rest of the year, see how it's working, you know, modify the placements and the bids on those. If it's, you know, with, usually I look at a seven day date range with those. I might look at a shorter date range. And that's something else I want to point out too, is the date ranges that you use when you're looking at data. If you don't have much order volume, most of the year, you want to look at 30 days. Uh, if you have enough order volume, seven days is probably ideal. Uh, during Q4, I'm looking at the last day, the last two days. I'm even looking at just today's data. I'm kind of using all three of them to make decisions on what should my bids be? What's the C CPC been? What's it, um, what were the conversion rates for it? And then looking at my actual sales data too because of the delay in data um, that those orders take, Amazon says 12 hours, but it's really like Is one to two days. It's at least yeah, so it, it's a challenge for sure. You almost have to like guess is like, okay, is this ad spend correlating to increase sales? Is there like actual correlation there? Because you can't even necessarily use, you might have something that looks like it's performing really badly. It's like, oh, it's got two orders and a hundred bucks in spend. But if you're, you're looking at your paid at your organic and it's got, you know, it's performing really well, then you can certainly keep the gas on those ads. Um, but back to your question about like the product, the campaign. So it's every type, uh, lottery campaigns definitely keep those going. If you're just getting started, probably the best way to start is lottery campaigns. There's all sorts of ways you can do this. If you're wondering how to set up your first lottery campaign, just, just do it. Just pick one and do it. Put all your stuff in one ad group and do it. And you can worry later about testing different segments by niche, by product, whatever. Uh, the most I would do is one for hoodies, one for standard tees. And mostly that's just due to the price difference. You can support higher CPCs on hoodies than you can on standard tees. So if you have all your your hoodies with your standard tees, you're losing out on a lot of traffic from those by just requiring lower bids just on average. Um, so just get started with that. Otherwise, uh, the other ones I saw work really well for uh, auto campaigns. My biggest was one of my biggest order drivers last year was a loose match automatic targeting group. Uh -huh. The next biggest one was a, a substitute, like ones that you maybe wouldn't typically think perform well. Those were by far, I mean, we're talking hundreds of orders on just this one targeting group um, for a single product. And oh, those, crazy. again, wouldn't be ones you typically would think or perform well. And sometimes they don't throughout the year, but for in Q4 where there's a lot of different search mm. terms going on. This might be new to some people, right? That you, you separate the different targeting groups out. Like you'll have one for close, one for loose, one for substitutes. Do you do that for your best sellers or do you do that for like everything? Because it sounds very- Just good. best sellers. It's, yeah. yeah, just the best sellers. Like keep it easy. Um, I, I see some people like take my advice. Like I have this complicated campaign structure. I have yeah. you know, 10 different campaigns and then they apply that to all their products. And that doesn't really make sense when you're not it's getting the data. Like that, any kind of, the more complex your campaign structure, the more data you need for that to work. If you're only getting a couple dozen orders a month, just stick to basics, just your automatic campaign and a manual campaign with maybe a couple ad groups in it for keywords and product targets. If you wanna segment those into like phrase match, exact match, broad match, product, fine. Um, but it really only makes sense to do like the, the all kinds of different segmenting when you have a bunch of different data. What is it really doing for you if you're getting one order every 60 days on this target? There's just nothing to work off of yeah. there. So yeah, start, start easy. Just one automatic targeting campaign with all the targeting groups enabled. If you see one start pulling away, 
um, that's the clear best winner or in the opposite case where there's one where it's performing really bad and bringing the others down, yeah, you can segment them at that time. Um, but otherwise, yeah, keep it all together. Keep it simple. Like We don't need to make advertising complicated. That's why I love lottery campaigns. I have maybe six or eight um, that are that perform. I've tested a bunch of them. I've kind of settled on these. I'll probably test more, but that's what it really comes down to is just like, hey, you know, like if you're asking the question, what do you think about this? Or like, would this work? Just test it. Like, test just it, yeah, yeah. I, I would 20, say 30 bucks at it. I would say this as well. It's also worth just just starting a new lottery campaign every other month. Just Just try it because I feel like sometimes you start a new one and suddenly it works really well. Whereas your old one, you were constantly optimizing and it just wasn't really doing much. Um, so just start a new lottery ca campaign every now and then. And even the stuff that's like not performing as well as you would like it to now, keep it running because you, you're getting the data now to optimize. And then in Q4 is where it will shine if you've got all that data, if you've optimized it a lot, rather than turning off all of the ads and like abandoning them because they're not at your perfect ad cost yet. Just leave them there. They're going to work better for Q4 rather than just starting a new campaign in like middle of November, right? So yeah, Amazon cares about sales history more than probably anything else. They want to know what's working, and that's what they're going to put in front of customers. So when someone has this like brand new product and I'm not getting any sales, I'm not showing up on the first page. It's like, why would Amazon show that product? They have no idea if it's going to sell or not. Like this isn't a charity to give everybody a turn to see if it sells. Their job is to sell as many products as possible. If they have this other product they know sold 300 times last month on the search term and yours that sold zero, they're going to show the one that sold 300 times. It just makes sense. Um, I want to just go back to the campaign stuff. We kind of got away from mm -hmm. it there. So, like, yeah. yeah, your automatic campaigns, I wouldn't discount any type of targeting group. Um, the other one I saw a lot of success from is competitor targeting. I shouldn't even say competitor targeting, but just product targeting. Because the ones that I saw work yeah. the best weren't even my competitors in the traditional sense where it's like another t-shirt. They're competitors in that they're different types of products like gifts for dad, like my shirt shows up for that. So does, I don't know, different massagers and coffee cups and whatever, you know, all these yeah. crazy products for dad. Like those are my competitors. And I saw a lot of order volume being driven from targeting those other products that are ranking for these top search terms. Um, I call this kind of campaign type a stack campaign where it's search term ASIN targeting. So I'm going to take a specific search term. Uh, ideally, one you're probably ranking for already so that you know your product is relevant to that search term. Uh, mm -hmm. And then just targeting, creating a, a manual product targeting campaign, targeting those top ranking ASINs on that search term. So I'll take the top 20, 30 products on Gifts for Dad and create a manual campaign targeting all of those. And those can perform really well. And product targets tend to have a lower cost per click than your keyword targets. Yeah, that's super interesting. I've tried this as well before. I don't think I did uh, during last Q4, but you know, products that are not t-shirts that people might be buying if they're interested in your niche. So uh, another example might be if, um, if you're selling dog t-shirts for a specific breed, right? You could look at what's ranking high there, so different dog foods or toys or whatnot. And if your t-shirt shows up for those around Christmas time, it's probably a good way to get extra sales because that's the sort of thing people look for, like a cheap and easy gift. Um, yeah, and yeah, like because those, those CPCs are lower. So your, your dog food is probably a really expensive search term to compete on, to target yeah. dog food and show up on the top results. But the products that are ranking for it already it's probably a lot cheaper to show up on their product page. So you're kind of in a roundabout way targeting that search term with a product. Um, and I think there's, there's arguments whether like product targets um, get weighted towards your ranking on search terms. I think they do. If someone, Amazon has this data. So if someone searches dog food, clicks on a dog food product, clicks on your ad, you're, you're gonna get some of that juice towards that search term because Amazon kind of saw that path and where they have the data on where the customer came from. So I think it does. No one knows for sure. It's we're all kind of just guessing. No one, ha I mean, to just test that kind of stuff with and have the data on it to say conclusively would be near impossible. But I think it does. But um, yeah, it's it's in a way you can compete for that search term much cheaper by prying the target, targeting the products showing up for that search term already. So it's an interesting 
um, strategy if you haven't considered that before. Yeah, because you know those products are getting a lot of traffic, right? So might as well benefit by placing it on the product page. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a good one that I forgot about. Um, that's worth trying. I got out. one more. I got one yeah. more to talk about. And I think it, for me, it was my biggest surprise last year oh. um, was Phrase Match. And I haven't done, up until that point, I, didn't, I hadn't really done tons of Phrase Match. I tested some. Um, I would do more broads because I figure like a broad match is going to cover any phrase match that, you know, it's just broader. Um, and then I have exact match, so I'm kind of covering all my bases there. Yeah. My best performing keyword or target, so I'm at all, all my campaigns, was a phrase match keyword. Um, and I had some others that were performing, but that single phrase match outperformed my next five best keywords combined, which were all exact match. And was that found through like an auto campaign, that specific phrase or, or how? That you... phrase would have came from my campaign structure of my manual campaigns, exact match, and then started testing different uh, match types of the exact matches that work. But uh, the source came from an yeah. automatic targeting group, you know, in Originally. some fashion. It came from, you know, I got the exact match from that. And then once that started performing well, I'd test different match types for it. Uh, a lot of different ways you can do this, but yeah, at the end of the day, like yeah, automatic campaign was sort of the source for all of this. Like this is that's how you start every single campaign. Like every product, I I should caveat this: every product um, that's selling well uh, should have an automatic campaign. You don't necessarily need one for every single possible product, especially in the merch space where you have yeah. tens or hundreds of thousands of products. Use lottery campaigns; you, you can't even launch that many. Um, automatic campaigns but yeah that's where to start if you have a bestseller or something that's selling 10 20 units a month yeah get a get an automatic campaign for it for sure that's the least you can do uh, yeah. and use that as for harvesting like what's going to work instead of guessing with a manual campaign what's working use the data from an automatic campaign yeah way easier way more hands off and this kind of relates to a question that someone asked in the asked in the discord server as well um, so if you're running like a lottery campaign, right, thousands of products, is there a point where you say, right, this this is sold a few times, I'll move it to a manual campaign, to a separate campaign. Um, do you ever do that with lotteries or? Yeah, I do. I, I probably don't look at mine as well. I don't get to spend as much time on my own ads as I wish I could, but um, yeah. yes, they're definitely worth looking at, see what ads or ASINs are selling well and launch some automatic campaigns for them it's definitely an easy way to go i don't have any like hard and fast rules like i do run a lot of ads based on gut feeling when it comes to that um i would say the ones to look for ones that are selling so like your top selling ones um launch an automatic campaign for um i don't necessarily do that with every single one sometimes i'll look at a product and it's super super niche to where mm -hmm. i'm not going to bother creating an automatic campaign for it because that lottery campaign is probably soaking up all the impressions anyways okay, yeah. from that where it's like what's the automatic campaign really going to do on this like super hyper niche that's you know pr probably going to sell a few times every six months um, yeah. so i'm probably not going to bother with that if, if there's something that i feel has potential for increased sales uh i'll definitely start an automatic campaign the other part of that and it's not even just the performers like stuff that's like has a low a cost and is performing the other great um, thing with moving them into a single ASIN is if you have a, say something in a lottery campaign that's selling, I don't know, it's sold five, six, seven times, but it's got really high A costs. Mm. You can also put that into an automatic campaign to have more control over that. So more control over the bids um, with negating um, search terms. So maybe it's just like one or two search terms that's it keeps getting clicks on, but doesn't perform on that's dragging everything down. You can control that. And just with budgets, just overall more control with that. So even if it's not performing, um, I'll do that. Yeah, it's well. like I can imagine if you if you have a product that has like five or ten orders, but it's got a sixty A cost, you might assume that's a waste of time. I'll just turn that off. But maybe maybe turn it off in the lottery and then move it to a separate. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. I would, I would turn it off, and I don't necessarily like turn off. Like if something is performing in the lottery campaign, I'm not going to turn it off. And this is just my general philosophy of like if something's working, don't mess with it. Like don't negate stuff. Like if yeah. you, you create a keyword from. Your automatic campaign don't negate it there until you know for sure it's working just overall, overall like don't mess with what's working 
And the other thing with lottery campaigns I'd say to look for is even if it's not performing in the lottery campaign necessarily, like if it's selling organically, that's another case to, and maybe I kind of touched on this, is create an automatic campaign. If you're starting to see it say, hey, this thing's selling five, six times every month, um, it's starting to get um, significant sales or consistent sales, or maybe it's just something that's like, it's getting like a handful of sales a month, but it feels like something that could perform well. Um, or has potential to compete on really competitive terms. I like those. I like stuff that can end up competing for super high volume terms to really turn into best sellers. Um, I'll start an automatic campaign there as well. If, you know, if it's another niche that's very competitive and it's not really hitting there. So looking for potential as well. What about you? Do you got any like, this is when I'm moving this lottery and yeah, it's a good question. I don't look at my lotteries too much either. It tends to be more like if what I do with them is if one product is wasting a lot of clicks and, and spend and not really getting sales, then I'll turn it off. But I've, I can't remember ever moving like from a lottery to an order campaign. It's more like what I do is if I've got best sellers, I'll create an order campaign, or um, if I've got an, if I'm launching a new product which I have some like belief in, whether it's for a holiday or a specific niche that I think works well, then I will create like a, a single ASIN. But yeah, I've never really moved from a lottery to an auto campaign, but it is interesting, right? It does make sense if-, if It's it worth looking it. at. Um, yeah. Part of that for maybe me and maybe for you is just we're, we're doing other stuff and not paying as much attention to our ads yeah. as maybe we could. There's always more you can do. There's more you can optimize. There's more Definitely. campaigns you can create. And should I be doing more? It's like, yeah, I like to have like optimal performance probably. It's just not something I can put as much time as I would like to. If you have the time, lottery campaign and you're just getting started with ads and you only have lottery campaigns are absolutely worth looking at to see what is performing um, and you could even create new lottery campaigns from the stuff that's not performing in that one lottery campaign so it's like hey everything hasn't got all these ads haven't gotten impressions pause them in that one and stick them in a new lottery campaign and see if those get impressions then uh, so there's a lot of different strategies you can do with it but definitely like getting rid of the ads that aren't performing so getting clicks and no sales. Uh, I use Merchstar, I do that as well. It's super easy to do in there just through our ad manager and have a save filter for zero orders and more than 15 or 20 clicks and just kind of yep. pause all these and take a look at those uh, yeah, once a exactly. week or so. I, I wanted to say that as well, like with doing the YouTube channel and obviously the other printed demand tasks on the side, it's like, I also find ads quite boring. So. I'm using Merge Jar now. Just you let that run in the background. I'll check every other week, like what my average A cost has been, and if that's sort of on target, I'm happy. Right? I know that Merge Jar is adjusting the bids, and if I do want to, you know, turn off uh, some of those poor performing things, you can also do that through Merge Jar quite easily. Um, so yeah, I think it's ideal for anyone who who doesn't have as much time at hand. If if you're not getting as much sales volume or you're new to merge, like it does make sense to learn these things and, and do them manually first. Um, I, I 100% agree. Yeah. yeah, if you're brand new, getting your hands dirty, um, you, you wanna know what's happening or like why something's working or why we do the things we do. And the best way to do that is just jump in and learn. If you're only gonna spend mm -hmm. 10, 20, $30 per month, um, doing it yourself is the way to go instead of just like leaving blindly to some tool. Otherwise, yeah, Merstar was created to save time because there are a lot of tedious tasks to do that are difficult through Amazon's own tools. You need spreadsheets to do it, especially on the scale of merch with where you end up with thousands of campaigns. So overall, it's just we built this tool to save time on those tedious tasks, those constant bid changes, negating search terms and so forth. But uh, yeah, so if you're tight on time and you want to uh, be able to focus on more of the strategy, um, Merstar is definitely there to help you. It is nice knowing that like in the background while we're talking, our, our bids are being adjusted on like a daily basis and we don't have to really worry about doing that all manually. Um, it's, it's it kind of spoils you a bit. I know I've gone like <laughs> three, four weeks without even like looking at my ads. Just yeah. I don't necessarily recommend that even if it's an automation tool, it's still yeah. best practice going, you know, once a week at least just to, you know, do some ma maybe manual tweaks, speed things up, kind of correct course a little bit, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'm the same. I've I've got kind of lazy a bit with <laughs> having merge jar and not checking I've, that's it much of the shit. How I describe I'm a, I'm like a lazy advertiser. I don't like <laughs> I like advertising, but I don't like to do all the like tedious stuff. So it's like yeah. anything that can I can automate 100 percent or anything I can make easier. 
yeah, I'm, I'm like that as well with most things. It's like, same with uploading designs. If, if I can automate it somehow, I, I usually try and do it. Um, but yeah, is, is there anything like, anything else we need to cover? Like, in your opinion? I, think we missed, or? I think we've done pretty well. Was there anything last year? So last year was your first year. Yeah. And this is your second. Was there anything that surprised you last year or any learnings you're going to that. take into this year or do differently? Well, one thing that definitely stands out and that I remember is that hoodie campaign doing really well, like a hoodie lottery campaign. So that's why I've, um, that's why I'm going to ramp that up again ahead of time. And I think I was just surprised at the like the performance, how how well it was doing, how much the ads were actually helping with sales, and how much easier it was to get like a decent ACOS. Surprisingly, right? You would expect if the bids are going up, you, you're going to struggle. But if you're not like, and I, I know you go for like a forty percent ACOS. <laughs> I push. I kind of push the limits. And I know like some people are shocked yeah. when they see my ACOS numbers because I'm yeah. I am really aggressive. I enjoy that. I kind of push the limits as much as possible. If you're not yeah. doing that, you don't want to do that. You're more risk averse. Um, you can definitely get probably a better A cost than you can most of the year just by being a little more conservative with your biz, just due to that increased conversion rate. Like I said, it's by the peak sales day. I was seeing. I, I looked at on the 16th of last year, my best sales day, I had a conversion rate of 25 percent on my ads. So at one out of four people that clicked on an ad bought the product that was being displayed. I mean, it was crazy where typically like a good conversion rate would be considered 10%, eight to 10% can be a solid conversion rate. That is really high. Merch. Yeah. Yeah. So to see something like that, and it's just, it's one of those things that slowly increases. And I think it's just desperate people looking for <laughs> like the first thing that can get delivered yeah. by uh, Christmas perhaps. But, but I, yeah, well, I think you're right. What I'll definitely say to people is like, you're in for a treat if you're new to, new to it, because yeah, you you might feel like you're struggling now with the ads, optimizing them, or like they're not really making much of a difference. But it's you know we're still still ahead of the best time of the year. So um, this is our Super Bowl, and I think it's yeah. it's very exciting. If this is your first one, I think it can be. I don't want to hype it up too much, but it can be bigger than your wildest imaginations. Like there's so much money flowing through Amazon. If you haven't gotten to that point where you have like these best sellers to see like a taste of it, it's bigger than you think. What I always try to remind people of is like, because of Q4, because you're picking up so many sales on like new random products, it typically bumps up your, your average sales for the next year, right? So if, if now you're making like 10 sales a month after Q4, you might be making 20 sales a month just by nature of I'm really glad you brought this up because that's something we didn't talk about was yeah how Q4 affects the rest of your sales mm -hmm. is by taking advantage of Q4, the more sales, it, you get more reviews, which leads into next year. Uh, you get increased ranking on the, the search terms that did perform well for your product. So it does have this carryover effect into the next year is you don't want to miss out on the Q4 sales, like be able to pick up yeah, maybe for your your smaller sellers, like a dozen new reviews has a huge impact, or possibly hundreds of reviews for something that does take off. I mean, that has a significant effect on your conversion rates going into the future. And that should also comfort people who might not experience like a great A cost, and who might be, you know, they're not really profitable. See it as an investment into the next year. If you've you know lost a hundred or two hundred dollars on your ads because your A cost was too high you've probably gotten a lot of extra sales which will help you out in the long run like next year with passive income so yeah i, th I think q4 yeah especially if this is your first q4 like this is a long-term game um i mean most in, in my opinion it takes three years plus to really reach any sort of product maturity i mean by the time you get reviews like if you only have a dozen couple dozen reviews like your product's just getting started like the fun doesn't really happen until probably a hundred reviews plus or like that's what I've seen when you have a chance to start like taking off or to ranking before that your product if it is like a competitive niche just isn't going to compete like it's just not going to have a chance and you probably do the same thing if you're shopping on Amazon you see something with five reviews yeah. you are far yeah. less likely to buy that than something that's got 500 reviews it's just human nature we all mm -hmm. do it so part of that is the investment in those sales and get more ratings and yeah, just that, you know, keep building that snowball effect. It's a mm -hmm. years long process. 
it can it can compound for sure for sure yeah only only like two months until black friday um excited it's yeah it's about two months but yeah do you have any like specific goals for this q4 royalties or i don't know like number of reviews i was really really close to uh 10k royalties in december last year so crack that and i'll be happy basically just do better than last year i feel like that's always the goal making progress comparing like if you're comparing your own stats to your previous year's stats i think that's that's the goal i don't really worry too much about hitting this specific target because i feel like that's it loses the point to try and focus more on like the process of what you're doing and and you know staying consistent rather than this magic goal which yeah isn't really going to make you happy it's i feel like as long as you're progressing you're doing things right better than last year is a great that's my goal yeah. i'd say that's like if i do it as well as last year i'll be more than happy yeah. um how's it looking last year was how's my projection looking it's it's looking pretty good i probably should dive into and see kind of where we're at year over year this time um i think it's pretty comparable um, so it's looking promising for a Q4. It's just one of those things you don't really know until you get into it, especially with, I mean, I have a lot invested in just this one single bestseller. So I think there's a lot of volatility that can come with that. So if I don't perform and hit the, you know, compete on these top search terms, that can drastically affect my sales probably more than someone that's just kind of has an even keel across all their products. So this is another reason I, I am super aggressive, but, uh, yeah, be at least like meeting last year's sales. I'll be happy. Last year was my best Q4. Uh, best month ever was in December. Um, so beating that, I'd like to hit a $10,000 sales day this December. That's my goal. I thought I was going to hit last year and then things dropped off. Like the day I thought I was going to get it on the 17th. If stuff, if, if the way it was trending, if the shipping dates continued, I think I would have, but I didn't. So I was a little disappointed and I didn't get that milestone. And it's just like, it's kind of a made up milestone. It doesn't really mean anything, but that's, I would love to see that this year and just exceed last year's royalties. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good target, a good goal for sure. But it's so exciting, right? If you, if you're watching your sales throughout the year, you're like, yeah, it's, it's looking better than last year. Like what's Q4 going to mean? Cause you do get, you do get surprised sometimes at like the increase year over year. So that's nice. I'm guessing, I'm guessing your last year was like massive compared to before or in it like yeah I don't, i'd have to look at what the, i don't even remember what i kind of have a short-term memory with some of this yeah. stuff it's kind of like <laughs> i don't care what i did two years ago three years ago uh, That's what i mean i remember time. like the first i mean my first december was maybe six thousand dollars in royalties oh well maybe when was that 2017 or uh, 2018, I think was my first Christmas and I had ads running. I was one of the early adopters, you could say. And yeah. I think I'd hit around maybe six. I'd have to double check, but now I'm hitting days that are more than that. So and maybe this is like, could be some inspiration for people that are just getting started. Like I don't see these kind of numbers. I didn't either in my first year, um, that these massive royalty numbers, it takes time to build those. And part of it is that I kind of uh found myself a best-selling product which you know part luck part and you know, like opportunity and just being prepared for it and running ads um but i've kind of gone through a few different bestsellers too this wasn't my first bestseller i had probably half a dozen other ones that i thought were going to be my bestseller and then they kind of fizzle out and this one's been pretty consistent and there's there could be a day where that ends um at some point there's you know this product life cycle that happens with every product yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. They they can drop off in sales eventually, but you'll have new designs that you know increase at the same time. So, can even out. But one thing you said there, I think, is really important to note is like your monthly sales back then can be your daily sales now, and and that's been my experience as well with so many different things. It's like if you're getting if you're starting out and you're getting like one or two sales a day, next year it might be ten or twenty sales a day. Like this can this can all very quickly shift, um, and sort of what your monthly sales are can become the norm for your daily sales so yeah you just um, have to keep putting in the effort um it's yeah. kind of like making those and it's hard to see like maybe month over month um like is the effort i'm putting in worth it because you're not going to see that effort it has such a such a delayed gratification to it where it's you know on a yeah. year's timeline i launched this product i'm not going to be profitable on it for two years like mm. have it you need to have that kind of timeline outlook and just putting in the work 
uh, week in, week out, and you'd see those really small incremental improvements. Like uh, Atomic Habits is a book by James Clear. Yeah. You've, you're familiar with it, where he talks about uh, making 1% improvements every day, where it's like, that doesn't yeah. sound like much, but Love over that. the course of a year, that 1% improvement every day is compounds. just compounds. It's kind of like that compounding factor. Uh, yeah, so it makes a, a massive difference. So keep at it. If you're just getting started, just keep learning and putting new products up. Um, advertising for sure. I think advertising is sort of a necessity. It's just part of the territory with mm. Amazon if you're going to see real long-term success. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just keep at it. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's a good note to, to end on, um, sort of a motivational mindset note. Um, yeah, stick at it. We're in for a for a nice time. It's starting to ramp up soon. Give it another month and your sales will be going up slowly if you're at Evergreen Niches. And yeah, I hope this video helped clear up some questions that people had around around ads and Q4. Um, yeah, fun, this fun was a lot of fun. We, we should do this again. Maybe we'll do another video or something. Dif uh, different topic, Q4. yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. or do update. I don't know. We got a lot of ideas. If you have any ideas for videos you'd like to see, yeah. Uh, from the two of us, yeah, put it in the comments. We, we definitely love the feedback. And if you have any questions, maybe we do another Q&A. Well, we're open to ideas. But, uh, yeah, it's been fun. Thanks for taking the time to just kind of chat about Q4. I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, the data recording. We're only a couple of days from the start of Q4. So we're getting ready to kick off. So Yeah, yeah. Can't wait. Yeah, thanks a lot for the for all the insight. Um, you've got a lot more experience than me, so I learned a lot of new stuff as well. Um, yeah, cool. Let's um, let's repeat this another time, different topic. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.